It's the dictionary. 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 What's up, word nerds? Welcome to the dictionary. Uh, hey everybody, how you doing? Um, I think I need to get a haircut. Yep, it's getting a little poofy and weird all up in the hair space. Hey, how are you? Thanks for joining me, listening, possibly watching to this podcast. If you want to watch it, you got to join the Patreon for $5 a month or more. It's just, it's a li- it's like a coffee, an espresso drink a month. That's it. You can spare that, can't you? For little old Spencer? All right, I have not read the words. I like sort of glanced down and I saw a few of them, but I haven't actually read through them. But I can tell you, we've, we are going to talk a lot about eggs today. So many egg things. Uh, and then the last few words are not egg related. Here we go. We got a bunch of words to get through. The first word in this episode is egg beater. One word. Again, you can say egg beater. Egg beater. Egg. I'm not going to say that every single time because we know some people like to say egg and some people like to say egg. Egg beater, one word, noun from 1828. One, a hand operated, probably not anymore, a hand operated kitchen utensil used for beating, stirring, or whipping, especially a rotary device for these purposes. Uh, So just any device that's going in a rotation, a spinny thing, uh, can be used to beat eggs, other things. Uh, What were the things that they listed? Beating, stirring, and whipping. Um, Anytime, when I was younger and I would uh, beat eggs, like for scrambled eggs or uh, French toast, I just used a fork. I didn't have a a hand-cranked egg beater. Um, But I guess... I guess, you know, they exist. There, there are things out there, people out there using egg beaters. Uh, I get, you know, if you're going to be beating a lot of eggs or, or other things that are a similar process, you're, you're not going to want to use a fork every time. It's going to really work on those forearms and biceps and triceps and stuff. Um, I think on social media, I want to post a picture of an old, old antique egg beater. I don't know why, but those old antique vintage versions of things I think are cool. Where did we come from? And this is where we are. Yeah. Let's see. Number two. Oh, the synonym uh, for egg beater is helicopter. I mean, I it's clearly the 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 the, the fins, the rotations, the rotaries, the uh the flying things, the things that make it go. Oh my brain. Uh, they're spinning. It's a rotation. It's a rotary device. And so if you were to take a helicopter and flip it upside down, you could beat a whole lot of eggs all at the same time. A helicopter. I don't think I've ever heard of a helicopter called an egg beater. It's probably, you know, the military or the, the, the airline people. They call them egg beaters all the time. Uh, roger, roger. We got an egg beater all up in here. Oh my god, I gotta make a sound effect. Oh, well, egg beaters, let's just go... That'll be a fun sound effect. The next word is egg case. Two words, noun, from 1847. This is a protective case enclosing eggs. Now, is this the, the thing that you put them in, like when you go to the store and you buy a dozen? Is that whole container called an egg case? Or... Not necessarily because we have an interesting similar simon, simon, si, synonym. <laughs> a similar synonym? Uh, it is the word, I do not know this word, utheka or uo theka or ou theka, something like that, because it is spelled O O T H E C A. Uotheka. It does say that it is called also egg capsule. But what, so a protective case enclosing eggs. I guess sometimes there are the are these like little holders. You could put one egg in a thing. Uh, man, I am fascinated by this one. 
an egg case. I mean, I just think it's the case that you put the eggs in, you know, when you, when you got to transport them. But maybe it's something different. Egg capsule is probably a, the single one. And then the egg case or the uotheka is the one you could put a whole bunch of them in. I don't know what other thing this could be. If your helicopter is making these sounds, please call the person who made it. Egg cell. This is two words, and cell is C-E-L-L. Noun from 1880. The synonym is ovum. And what's interesting, I don't know if they mentioned this in the previous episode. Who's they? Uh, I don't know if it was mentioned in the book in the previous episode, but the egg is a single cell. It's one, isn't it? I think, right? It's a it's a single-celled organism. Not that it's like living and moving and stuff, but uh, I believe, I believe that is the case. It's an egg cell opposed to a different kind of cell, also called an ovum. <laughs> egg cream, two words, noun from 1906. A sweetened drink made with milk or cream and other ingredients. <laughs> you know, just those other ingredients, anything. Maybe there's some cilantro in there, some chipotle seasonings, some uh, jalapeno. I don't know. I was going in the spicy direction. Uh, other ingredients, especially a drink consisting of milk, a flavoring syrup, and soda water. But it doesn't mention eggs at all. You'd think that something called egg cream has eggs in it. Maybe we need to post a link in the show notes for egg cream. Uh, maybe a bit of recipes for egg cream. Do they actually call for egg? Do you just use the egg white or the egg yolk, one or the other or both? I don't know. But, you know, it's it's got cream in there. And maybe it looks kind of eggy. Uh, and that's why they call it egg cream. I would like a vegan version of this, please. Uh, not so sure if I want the soda water. Maybe another version. Uh, but yes. Ooh, yeah, it sounds good. Egg cup. One word. Egg and cup. Put them together. You got the word egg cup. Noun from 1773. A cup for holding an egg that is to be eaten from the shell. I have never used one of these. Maybe you could also call it an egg case or or an uotheka. Uh, you've seen this. You definitely have seen this in TV shows and movies where people, often fancy people, I feel like, either fancy or British or both, uh, and they, in the morning, they are eating their egg out of an egg cup. Uh, the, you know, the bottom half or so of the egg is sitting in the cup, and then they, they've opened up the top, and they got a little tiny spoon, and they're spooning it out and eating it, and I have never eaten an egg that way. I don't know what uh, what what way, what, what cooking way is this? What is it called? Um, oh, I know, I know they're all in my brain, but I can't, I can't come up with them. I got hard-boiled and over-easy, medium, over-hard, all those things. Um, pup, it's with a P, I think, isn't it? Uh, how do you like your poached? Could be poached. I don't know. I don't know all the different ways. I don't know why. What what is the differences? Why do people like some better than others? I don't know. But you gotta have an egg cup if you're gonna eat it in whatever way this is. You can spoon it out and eat it and slurp it. And I don't know what people do with eggs. Hmm. Next is. Egg Fu Young, Egg Fu Young, and you can spell it a few ways. Uh, in all three ways, it is three words, egg and fu, F-O-O, those stay the same. But the third word, young, could be spelled either Y-O-N-G or Y-O-U-N-G or Y-U-N-G. One O, one U, or one of each. Egg Fu Young. Noun from... 1917. Now, this is when it got into English in 1917. I'm pretty sure it's been in, well, it says it's a Chinese word. Uh, it's probably been in their, their vernacular, their, their language for many, many more years. Although, I don't know if they would say egg, though. We'll look at the etymology in a minute. Hold your horses. 
Egg foo young is a fried egg patty con- containing vegetables as bean sprouts and sometimes meat. Even when I ate eggs, I don't think I ever had one of these. It sounds it sounds fine. I mean, I, like I said, I don't I don't have any issues with eggs. I like them fine, uh, but I just don't eat them. So it's in a patty made from a fried egg. Uh, so yes, this is a Chinese word. It looks like the the language or the region is Guangdong, and their word looks like it's just fa young. Fa Young, it's two words. The first word is spelled, well, I guess you'd say in English, uh, F-U-H. And the second word is Y-U-H-N-G, Fa Young. And that just means egg white or, God, I keep on losing my place, uh, egg white or egg coated ingredients. Oh, interesting. But literally, a kind of hibiscus. Now that seems so unrelated to eggs. That's fascinating. So fa or fu, maybe it's fu, fu young, that makes more sense. Egg fu young, fu young, means literally a kind of hibiscus, but also it means egg white or egg coated ingredients. And then in English, we put egg at the beginning because, you know, we need to make it clear for Americans that this is egg related, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in China, do they just say fu young? I'll have some fu young. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Fuh, 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 fuh. Egghead. One word. Noun from 1952. The synonyms are intellectual and highbrow. I am not an egghead. Uh, yeah, this, I think this just, it doesn't have any etymology, but I believe the idea here is like, oh, you're so smart. You got such a big brain. It's like shaped like an egg. And that's why we're going to call you egghead. And... I think that uh, it was probably meant to be more disparaging and, and not a nice thing to say in the 50s, but I think as time has gone on, uh, people sort of took it as a, as a badge of honor. Yeah, I'm an egghead. I'm a smarty pants. Um, okay, where? Whoa, oh, so next word. Eggheaded. Adjective from 1938. 1938, but egghead is 1952. Well, egg-headed is having the characteristics of an egghead, but if egghead was in 19... didn't come till later, how how did we have the word egg-headed before? 14 years before? Uh, egg-headedness is a noun. That's that's crazy and fascinating. How did how did we get what something something they ain't working right there? I think they need to go back to their research and find when did Egghead really come to being? Probably in 1938, give or take. All right. Fop, 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 fop. Egg nog. One word, egg nog. Noun from circa 1775. I definitely get the vegan eggnog every year. And oh, it's so tasty and good. And I could drink a whole carton in one sitting, but I won't because that's not healthy. But I could. This is a drink consisting of eggs beaten with sugar, milk, or cream, and often alcoholic liqueur. When I was younger, I had no idea about this whole alcoholic liqueur thing. I just loved eggnog. And then as I got older, I realized people put stuff in it. Like, was it brandy, I think, uh, is, a, is a popular alcoholic liqueur to put in the eggnog? Um, sorry, my nose is super itchy, and I don't know why. Okay. Eggnog, please uh, give me some eggnog. I will love it. Uh, it's got to be vegan, though. Got to be vegan. I don't think I have a favorite. I haven't really been paying attention to the brands uh, of the eggnogs that I've been getting over the last 10 years or so. Um, they're all good to me. I'm not terribly picky. Next. You got to use the egg beater if you want to make some authentic eggnog. You got to beat the eggs. But boy, that is an unhealthy drink. You got eggs in there, first of all. You know, if you're drinking a lot of this, you got, you're got you getting a lot of eggs in you. Uh, also, milk or cream, you know, and that that's dairy, especially the cream. It's very heavy and a lot of stuff going on there. And the sugar. <laughs> we don't need so much sugar in our life. I love sugar, but I try, I'm trying to cut down. Uh, so yeah, not a healthy drink. 
just have it in moderation. Okay, next, I already did the sound effect. Eggplant. One word. Noun from 1767. It's not the most creative name, I think. Oh, it's a plant, and it looks kind of like an egg. It's an eggplant. Okay, 1A. A widely cultivated perennial Asian herb of the nightshade family, yielding edible fruit. And the species name is Solanum melongena. Melongena, something like that. Uh, Yeah, well, it doesn't give a lot of specifics on like what it looks like or anything. So there's a whole, probably a whole range of types of eggplants. Uh, But we got more. 1B. The usually smooth, ovoid, typically blackish purple or white fruit of the eggplant. So the eggplant produces this fruit that is typically blackish purple. It is a very cool color. I really like that color. Or white. Have I seen any white eggplants? I think I have. Yeah. Uh, Smooth ovoid. Ovoid means it's, you know, got this sort of ovum oval shape to it. Okay, number two for eggplant. A dark grayish or blackish purple. So this is just the color, the color eggplant. Yeah, blackish purple, that makes sense. We got it. We see a lot of eggplants that are this dark, cool purple. Or a dark, dark grayish. Oh, I see. Dark grayish or blackish purple. So it's a purple that's blackish or grayish. And it's dark. There is no etymology, which kind of frustrates me, but I think it's pretty obvious what it is. I was hoping there would be something more interesting for eggplant. Next is egg roll. uh, Two words. I don't know why I almost said one word. Two words. Noun from 1934. Uh, this is this is the contest where you have to roll your favorite egg down the hill, and whoever gets down to the bottom of the hill first wins. This is actually a thin egg dough casing filled with minced vegetables and often bits of meat, as shrimp or chicken, and usually deep fried. Oh yes, you gotta fry it. That's that makes it so crispy and good. Ooh, I do, I do like these. Again, haven't had any authentic egg rolls for a while, but I do sometimes um, get some vegan egg rolls. I can't, I guess you can't call them egg rolls. Uh, maybe sometimes maybe they have a different name for those. But um, yep, I like these. You dip them in that sauce, that sort of like s- sweet sour sauce, and ooh, I'm hungry. I have, I need to eat some food after this. Oh, I forgot to say, it is currently 7:26. A.M. July 28th. I'm in my work office again and will be almost every single time I do this probably for a long time. I could go for some egg rolls, please, and thank you. Eggs Benedict is next. Two words. Benedict has a capital B. Oh, there's a whole bunch of extra information there. I'm not going to read it. It is a noun from 1898. Poached eggs... Poached eggs has come up again. Poached eggs and broiled ham placed on toasted halves of English muffin and covered with hollandaise. This is also, this is a very tasty breakfast. I've I've gotten a few of these in my day. That hollandaise sauce is creamy and scrumptious. But again, I can't have no regular eggs, Benedict, just the vegan ones, please, and thank you. Uh, Broiled ham that it's i think it's yeah it's like a big old slab of ham on there and it's an english muffin i guess some places might not do an english muffin maybe they do something else but i think most of them do um where does this name come from who is this benedict person uh it just says it's probably from the name benedict so like was there no specific benedict person Benedict Cumberbatch was like, I like this combination of foods. Uh, throw it together for me, please. Um, you can call it um, you can call it a Benedict. But no, we have to put in the word egg. Why? Eggs Benedict. Poached eggs, hard-boiled eggs, eggs Benedict. Why isn't it Benedict eggs? But seriously, where's the name? 
Why did we put the name in? It had to have been a, a specific Benedict person who made this, I think. Maybe we got to put a link in the show notes for Eggs Benedict. Okay. Next is eggshell, one word, first form, noun from the 14th century. One, the hard exterior covering, oh, I see, the hard exterior covering of an egg. I mean, that's, that's it. It's the shell of the egg. Two, something resembling an eggshell, especially in fragility. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a very sensitive person, and so maybe if you start talking down to me, uh, my eggshell will break and I will start crying, uh, because what would that be? Something about myself is like an eggshell. Uh, just something fragile. That's an eggshell. The second form of eggshell is an adjective from 1835. One, thin and fragile. You just describe something as eggshell because it is thin and fragile. Fragile. Number two, slightly glossy. Well, I guess eggshells are slightly glossy. They're not totally matte and they're not totally glossy. So I guess that's, I never really thought about why, why we uh, call paint eggshell. Because it's just slightly glossy. It's just, that means slightly shiny. Three yellowish white now this is again color paint stuff like that a yellowish white so it's a white it's a little on the yellow side um would you say that an egg shell the actual shell of an egg is yellowish white i mean they come in all sorts of colors but maybe maybe a little yellow just trying to visualize eggs in my head let's visualize some eggs I don't know if I would say yellow, but maybe a little bit. Okay, that was a good visualization. Blah, 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 blah. Next is egg timer. Two words. Noun from 1884. A small sand glass for timing the boiling of eggs. I don't know. What is it? Is it a minute? Two minutes? It's probably not very long. I don't know if I've literally ever boiled an egg. Uh, but you need, back in the day in the 1800s, yeah, let's post a picture on social media of an old, 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 old egg timer. Uh, sand glass. Now, is this an hourglass? Is that why, was that how we say sand glass? Uh, you flip it over, the sand goes down, and it goes for a certain amount of time. That's probably what it is. The last egg word is egg tooth. Two words. Noun from 1893. A hard, sharp, prominence yeah prominence on the beak of an unhatched bird or the nose of an unhatched reptile that is used to break through the egg shell and i think that they lose it after that don't they does it i don't know how does it fall off do they grow does it grow into their body i'm not sure how what happens to the egg tooth when the little baby is done with it oh my god i lost my egg tooth yeah, they need something, they need a little extra something to poke through. And they're like, I don't know what's going on. I'm trapped in this room. I can't get out. All I can do is bob my head like this. And then all of a sudden, it breaks through the fragile, yellowish, slightly glossy eggshell. Uh, okay. The next word is, I guess you would pronounce it aegis maybe? Well, I'll tell you, it's a variation of Aegis, Aegis, which is a synonym, A-E-G-I-S. And I want to do a quick look at the pronunciation because I want to give you accurate information. And I think that it's either Aegis or Aegis, uh, something like that. This is just another way to spell it. I would assume it's Aegis because it here it is spelled with an E. Uh, you can say Aegis or Aegis. Either one is perfectly fine. And it does show here in the A section, it does show E-G-I-S as another spelling of that. I'm not going to tell you what it is, though. you got to go back to that episode and listen if you haven't. Uh, if you're new to this, uh, if you just started in the E's, go back, please. Go back to the A's and go through and 
you can watch this uh, journey and evolution with 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 everybody. Next is Eglantine or Eglantine. E G L A N T I N E. Eglantine. Noun from the 14th century. The synonym is sweetbriar. And I don't know what that is. I would guess it's some sort of plant. I think of briar patch and something sweet. I don't know. I don't know. Eglantine. Uh, the etymology says this is from from Middle English. Before that was Anglo-French eglant, eglant, from Vulgar Latin aculentum, from Latin acus, which means needle, mm-hmm, and akin to the Latin word acer, which means sharp. Uh, and there's more at the word edge. So. What? So sharp, needle, yeah, that makes sense. So sweet briar. I mean, I think the briar patch, doesn't it have, you know, pointy little needles on it? So yeah, it could be related to that. Hmm. Eglantine, eglantine. I am not familiar with this at all, but it's probably something that grows that is sharp and pointy, so stay away from it. Next is eglamiza. Oh, I should have looked at the pronunciation first. Egla mise or uh, egg, so egla mise or egla mise or egla mise, egla mise or egla mise, something like that. It is spelled E G L O M I S E, or you can put accents on the E's, the beginning and the end, that goes boop down on the left and up on the right. Eglamise. Sure. Adjective from uh, 1877. Made of glass on the back of which is a painted picture that shows through. Ooh, this is fascinating. We got it. Got to post a picture of this on social media. Uh, made of glass on the back. Okay, so there's glass. And on the back of the glass, they painted a picture. And so you can see it on the other side. So you don't paint it on the front. You paint it on the back. What's the point? Why? What's 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 the, we, what's the point of point painting it on the back or the front? Would you get a different look? Yeah, I think it give it uh, when you point it <sighs> when you paint it on the back, you see the glass on the front and it gives it a little bit of a something, a glassy a thing. I don't know. Yeah, I could th- I make sense. I like it. I haven't seen it, but I like it. The name of this is from, it's French, obviously, from the verb eglomisere, which means, wow, this is what it means. This is a long explanation for that one word. It means to decorate a glass panel by painting on its back. I mean, how more literal can you get? Uh, This is from Jean-Baptiste Glomy, G-L-O-M-Y, with a capital G, uh, who was a French decorator who died in 1786, and then this word didn't come into, I guess, English until 1877. And so this French decorator, Jean-Baptiste Glomy, was uh, just taking glass and painting on the back of it. <laughs> painting on the back of it. I'm, i got to leave some of that stuff in. And was like, here, here's my eglomise. Enjoy. All right, we got one more word. Ooh, and this is this is a biggie. Uh, we're gonna talk more about this in the next episode. We got a lot of related words there, but this last word. I'm ready for my eggs. I have a little bowl here. I could could whip up some eggs, but I'm not going to because I don't want to. This last word is ego. E G O. Oh yeah, we got a number of definitions. It is a noun from 1789. One. The self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. So myself, I am ego, contrasted with yourself and also the world. The whole world and nothing but the world. Okay, that's an interesting one. 
Um, maybe not. Maybe not exactly. I don't know. That there's not there's there's, there's a lot to this word. Uh, but we got some more definitions. Boy, and three is long. Okay, two a. The synonym is the second definition for the word egotism, uh, which is going to be in the next episode. Yeah, egotism. That's a fun topic. And to be is the number one definition for the word self-esteem. So egotism basically is like, I'm feeling real good about myself. I'm the best. That's an easy, easy way to say it, essentially. Self-esteem, this is a bit of a different context, a bit, bit of a different thing. Um, if you have a lot of self-esteem, you're feeling good about yourself. If you have low self-esteem, you're not feeling so good about yourself. So yeah, it's a little bit of a different thing. But first definition for self-esteem, when we get there in the S's, uh, ego. That's ego. But we have number three. Here we go with number three. The one of the three divisions of the psyche in psychoanalytic theory that serves as the organized conscious mediator between the person and reality, especially by functioning both in the perception of and adaptation to reality. Ha, oh, it's a lot there. Okay, so the three divisions, it says compare to the id and superego. So in psychoanalytic theory, uh, what, Freud, I think, Jung, and those pe- people, I'm not an expert on this, uh, they said in our brains, our psyches, our whatever, our minds, we have the ego, the id, and the superego. And I only know the very basics of this, and the ego is the one that I think most of us know the best. Um, I think the id, is that like your, like your, your unconscious, like who you are as the, at your, like, at your core or something? I don't know. Um, but we got it. We do have to break this down a little bit. Um, okay, so it's one of the three divisions in psychoanalytic theory. It serves as the organized conscious mediator between the person and reality. So it's the thing that doesn't really exist except in your consciousness that mediates between you and reality. So it looks at reality and it looks at yourself and it sort of sees how you fit into reality and what, I don't know. But there's more, especially by functioning both in the perception of reality and the adaptation to reality. So how does yourself, how does you, who you are, your personality, how do you view reality? We all view it differently. And also, how do you adapt to that reality? Oh, boy, this is this is such a big topic that I'm, I feel so dumb about this. Um, but, you know, real simply, you know, I think if you say you got a lot of, if you got a lot of ego, um, it's, a, it's, all, it's all about self. It's like I'm thinking about myself and I feel good about myself and I'm important. Um, yeah, ooh, we're going to dig so much more into this in tomorrow's episode because <laughs> we got egoism, egotism, egomania. Yeah, some interesting stuff there. But yeah, it's, I definitely got to put a link in the show notes for ego, id, super ego, that whole topic. Uh, I do recommend you read up on this because it's a fascinating thing that I never really studied, but I just sort of picked up little bits and pieces throughout life. And uh, yeah ego it's a weird thing we all we all think about it we all talk about it whether or not we're aware of it um what does the etymology say this is interesting huh i guess it's a latin word that means i like me i and there's more at the word i right yeah just the letter i so uh you know at the beginning of the eyes we'll get to talk more about who am I? Me, myself, and I. And what am I? Who am I? Who are you? Are we the same? Are we different? We're, I don't know. This is, this is a, the, the topic of like self and who I am is obviously something I think a lot about because I've said that. That's why it's obvious. And, uh, you know, you probably do too. I think we all do. We're all stuck with ourselves forever. 
and you can't help but think about yourself uh, just because you're just constantly with yourself and who what's who do you do and what do you do and what who what do you do and who are you I don't know I don't know uh, but th- I, I do I do love to get guests on the show and and learn about them uh, because as much as I am fascinated about who I am and why I am the way I am and what am I doing in this world, uh, I am equally as fascinated by the other people in the world. And I just want to talk to people, interview people, and get to know them um, because it's just I just it's just fascinating, fascinating to learn about other people. And if you're not doing that, I think you should. I think we need to do more about that, more with that, more of that. All right, real quick. Let's reread the words and pick a word of the episode. It's going to be hard. We had egg beater, egg case, egg cell, egg cream, egg cup, egg foo young, egg head, egg headed, egg nog, egg plant, egg roll, eggs benedict, egg shell, egg shell, egg timer, egg tooth. <laughs> Sounds so f- weird. Aegis. Eglantine or Eglantine, Egg, Egla Mise, and Ego. Well, I am tempted to pick Ego, uh, but we are going to talk a lot more about that in tomorrow's episode, um, just because it's just a crazy concept. Um, but I think I got to pick Eggnog as the word of the episode. Give me some eggnog. I want some eggnog during the holiday times. Why don't we have eggnog year round? I don't know. Why can't we have eggnog year round? I want some eggnog right now. Please and thank you. Yep, that's it. That's fine. Um, I gotta grab my phone. It's down over here charging because for some reason it didn't charge last night. Uh, oh yeah, we do. We definitely getting more charges. Let's talk about another movie I watched. Oh, gentlemen prefer blondes. Uh, Sharon and I watched this a little while ago. Uh, okay, this I think it's from the fifties, uh, and it is so much a product of its time. Jane Russell and Marilyn Monroe, and just it's so it's so cringy and uncomfortable from today's standards because it is just all about looking good and marrying for money uh from marilyn monroe's character's perspective that's all she wants is just to marry rich and she doesn't care about anything else you know the song uh diamonds are a girl's best friend diamonds are a girl's best friend that i think this is the movie that it comes from unless it was from before but it's heavily in this movie and but jane russell's character I like her because I, if I remember correctly, she's kind of counteracting what Marilyn has to say, and uh, you know, she's. She, I think she's more about love and less about money. Um, anyway, it's a fascinating look at that time. Um, but I, it's it was just real uncomfortable throughout most of it. So yeah, there there's some funny stuff. There, there, like that little kid character, he's pretty funny. Um, okay, I think that's all I got to say to you today. Thank you for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.